Hi, welcome to Yeshua House. I'm Pastor Anita Wilkerson, and this is Believer School. We started Believer School to help believers understand their rights and responsibilities in Christ. And so we just don't have to get run over by the devil. You see, the Word of God says in Hosea 4, 6, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So we started Believer School to help people understand that we don't have to get run over by the enemy. So um, today, this unit we've been working on is about spiritual principalities and how to be free. And tonight, we're going to look at envy and jealousy. So let me share my screen with you, and we will get started. Okay, so... Let me get rid of that. Um, so we're going to look at envy and jealousy. And, you know, each night I like to talk about um, the objectives. I want to, us to know what envy and jealousy is and get a basic understanding for how envy and jealousy as principalities work and affect people. And then I also want to make sure that we get to what is godly jealousy because that exists as well. So envy and jealousy, um, envy is um, wanting someone, something someone else has, like their job or their house or their car, or maybe, you know, their children behave really well and you wish your children were like theirs, or money. Um, jealousy is... Um, an overprotectiveness, a guardedness about something you have, like you have it, but you're not willing to share. So um, let's go forward. Here we go. What does the Bible say about envy and jealousy? Well, in Proverbs 14 30, it says, A sound heart is life to the flesh, but envy rottens the bones. Do you know there's some diseases that are all about the bones not being able to do what they need to do because they're not able to function the way they need to function as bones? Job 5.2 says, For anger slays the foolish man, and jealousy kills the simple or naive. See, jealousy will make the simple and naive do things that they probably shouldn't do, which cause death. Romans 1, 28 through 31. This is the amplified version. Um, it says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God or consider him worth knowing as far as like their creator, God gave them over to the depraved mind to do the things which are improper and repulsive until they were filled, permeated and saturated with every kind of unrighteousness wickedness, greeted, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, mean-spiritedness. They are gossips, spreading rumors, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of new forms of evil, disobedient, disrespectful to parents, and without understanding untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, like without pity. So these people that envy and jealousy have a hold of really have this whole list of things it is not good to have, you know? Moving forward. The Bible also says in Mark 7, 20 through 23, and he said, whatever comes from the heart of man, that is what defiles and dishonors him. For from within, that is from the heart of man, come the base of evil, malevolent, malevolent, that word's tough right now, thoughts and schemes, acts of sexual immorality, thefts, murders, adulteries, acts of greed, covetousness, which we'll find out in a minute is part of envy and jealousy, wickedness, deceit, and unrestrained conduct, Envy and jealousy as well, slander, profanity, arrogance, and self-righteousness, and foolishness, poor judgment, 
All these evil things, schemes and desires, come from within and defile and dishonor man. So it's not, I mean, the, the Hebrews, especially in the early days, were like, man, you didn't wash good enough, or you didn't eat the right food, so you're unclean. But Jesus said that it's the things that come out of a man that show whether he's clean or unclean. So what is envy and jealousy? We went over that just a minute ago. Envy, envy is wanting something that someone else has. And then jealousy is not willing to share the things that God has given you. So I think that's a good place. I think we'll, we'll stop right there. Um, envy and jealousy are very powerful dynamics built into them. Like what you have, but... I like what you have, but I hate you because you have it. And it makes us compare ourselves to others. It will keep you from being who you were called to be by God. Um, and it will keep you, your identity wrapped up in people and things and stuff. Um, you don't stop long enough. It doesn't stop long enough for you to grow in what God has for you. So envy and jealousy also always suggest that God won't provide for you. Um, and then other people's envy, other people's envy can steal your joy. So I had a lady one time and she had, she was a very godly woman, had a beautiful house and had people over. And the, the lady that came over was so jealous of the house that it made her feel bad. She had, she had envy. She wanted the lady's house and made her feel bad because she had a beautiful house. So if jealousy and envy are bad, then what is this God's jealousy thing? What is that? We see, we need to understand God's jealousy because that's different than our jealousy. God's jealousy, well, let's, God's jealousy is the love for his children and he tells us in the Ten Commandments, we're not to have any other gods before him. That he is our God. And he protects his children and he loves his children. Here, let's see what the Bible says. So Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord and they provoked him to jealousy and with their sins which they had committed above all that that their fathers had done. You see, God is jealous when we serve other gods, when we don't serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You see, God, he's righteous and he's zealous and he loves his children and doesn't want anything bad going on with his children. So in Ezekiel 8, 3, it says, and he put forth the form of his hand and took me by the lock of my head. This was Ezekiel and, and a, a vision he had. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me to the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door at the inner gate that looks towards the north, where was seated the image of jealousy, which provoked to jealousy. See, there's an image of jealousy. This, it wants, um, it wants, it wants us to follow jealousy. It doesn't want us to follow God. And it will, it will, will not share. God does not want to share us with a false God. And jealousy wants us to worship a false God. Whether it be people or things or a way of doing things. It's all a part of this envy and jealousy spirit. James 3.16, for where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. When we have an idol, God is in his jealousy, will put away, will pull away, and let that idol protect us instead of protecting us instead of God being able to protect us he lets that idol the thing that we think is going to protect us stay it's not a good trade-off because that idol that piece of wood that relationship is not going to protect you the way God will okay and then we got to James 
316 envy and strife there is no there is confusion wherever evil work if you've got envy going on and you got you know i want what you have and i don't like you because you have this thing then envy and strife there's discontentment there's confusion and every evil work the word of god tells us so we have to be really aware of what's in our atmosphere so that we can make the right choices for us so what are the consequences of listening to envy and jealousy? So let's look at Hebrews 13, 5, the consequences of listening to envy and jealousy. Um, let your conversation be without covetousness. We're going to look at that word in just a minute. And be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. God will never leave you or forsake you. So don't, don't worry about what other people have. Don't worry about what their situations are. If they're better than yours, don't do that comparing. Don't let that thing get in there and say, see, look, you're missing out. Look at what so-and-so has. Yeah, don't listen to that thing. Okay. So envy and jealousy are going to produce strife and they won't let you have peace. So these are two situations, the Hebrews 5 and the James 3.16, where it's the word of God is telling us envy and this covetousness, these things are, are here to take away our peace and, and to put strife in our life. I don't like strife. Strife makes, makes life hard. So in Luke 12.15, and he said unto them, take heed and be aware of covetousness for a man's life consists not in the abundance of things that he possesses. You see, our life, we are spirit beings. See, we're a spirit being first. We have a soul, our mind, will, and emotions, and then we live in a body. So we need to take care of those spiritual things first. Don't let those physical things take over. And then the last one I want to look at, and then we'll go back for a minute, is Galatians 5, 25 through 26. If we live in the Spirit, so let us walk in the Spirit, and let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and envying one another. So we don't want to create that strife in our life. We want to create peace in our life. So I want to go back and look at that Hebrews 5, scripture because i want to take some of those words apart and look at it and because my number one thing is to make sure we get understanding not that just i present a lesson but i want you to get some understanding because understanding gives you real hearing of the word of god and when we hear the word of god then we're able to grow so it is very similar to what i read earlier let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things that you have for he has said I will never leave you or forsake you. Serving others without seeking gain. It is so important that when we serve others, it's not, well, I'm going to give you this because I, I'll get it back. I'm going to invite you to my house for dinner because I know you'll invite me to your house for dinner. Uh, it's giving to get. It, it's that love if, love because of acceptance. Um, do something seeking gain is rooted in envy and jealousy. And coming from my background, I didn't know that. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know I was doing it until I heard this lesson. And then once my eyes were open to what envy and jealousy was, it was like the Lord started showing me in my own life where envy and jealousy had taken root and where, you know, I did things to get acceptance and I did things because I wanted to be loved. I wanted that little pat on the back where somebody said, hey, good job. So let's look at it from the words. Let your conversation be without covetousness. That's Strong's 866, and that is um, Greek. And it's payment or rewards. In covetousness, you're looking for that payment or reward. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Okay, I thought there was another word in here, but there's not on um, this one. So Hebrew, um, the Hebrew word, understanding 
for covetousness is payment or reward. So let your conversation be without trying to get payment or reward. You're not, you're not there to say nice things to get something back. You're there to have a conversation to share the good news, right? Okay, moving forward. So here he is. What is covetousness? So covetousness, let's look at Romans 12, 18. I always like to go back to the word to define things and help us understand things. For he shall grow up before them as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now, guys, I think I may have had that question out of order. No, this is it. So you can covet someone's, there's, I mean, Jesus grew up without covetousness. There was no covetousness in him. He, he wasn't seeking for his own. He was only doing, he says, I only say what my father says, and I only do what I see my father do. So with covetousness, you may covet somebody else's healing. You may be comparing your sickness to someone else's wellness. Um, you might be comparing your sickness to someone else's healing. Um, it, anyway, envy, um, either way, it'll make you feel envy, and then e envy will stop your own healing. So that's real important to know, too. So what is this nature of envy and jealousy? Well, first of all, they can be very, very subtle. And you've got to know what you're looking for to be able to see these guys. Um, we need to be careful not to judge one another after the flesh because that's really easy to do. Um, there's envy and jealousy stories that are in the Bible, and I'm not going to go pull the stories, but I want to talk about them for just a minute. You see, in, in Haman and Mordecai, Haman had the the sin of pride. He was prideful. And so his, his, because Mordecai would not bow down before him, he tried to kill all the Jewish people. Yeah, he did. So that, that envy and jealousy in him ended up with his own death. And if you want to look up that story, you can look it up in Esther. Okay. Um, then envy and jealousy also leads to rebellion uh, with Mo Moses and uh, Korah. Uh, Korah came up and God had appointed Aaron as high priest, but Korah came up and said, you know, we're just as good as you are. You know, he said, you're to be boss over us. We want to be boss too. And so God uh, Wiped them all out. Then they said, everybody move away from them and just wiped them all out. The, the desert opened up and swallowed them right then and there. And uh, then bitterness could also be uh, seen when we have envy and jealousy, this nature. What does it look like? It can show up as bitterness. Saul and David. You know, David loved Saul. And Saul loved David until Saul found out that David had the king's anointing. He figured it out. And he could not deal with the fact that his son and his family would not be king, even though God had told him he would no longer be king and it was removed. He wanted to kill David to keep David from becoming king king. And then uh, another story with the bitterness is Joseph and his brothers. It says in there that Joseph, the brothers hated Joseph so much they couldn't speak a kind word about him. They couldn't speak about him and say something nice. Uh, Indian jealousy also has uh, control. Uh, Sarah and Hagar. You see, Sarah couldn't get pregnant, and so she told Abraham to have a child with Hagar, and Hagar got pregnant. Well, then Hagar didn't really want to, you know, be the servant anymore because she was carrying the, the child of Abraham, and uh, Sarah got jealous, and so Sarah ended up having to send her away. Uh, that we also need to know that wars between nations are created because of envy and jealousy often. I mean, when you look at it, when you look where the money went, when you look about why people felt the way they did, 
the bottom line in there, you're going to find that envy and jealousy. Um, so like, why do people hate the U.S.? Because we're prosperous. Why do, um, why do uh, they hate the Jews? Because the Jews are prosperous. And we have the blessing of God. If we try to prosper ourselves, it puts a curse on us. We're, we're blessed and prosperous because we serve Yeshua Mashiach. And that puts a blessing on us. Okay, so let's go look at Colossians 3, 5. And I've got several um, versions of this again because I really want to make sure we understand what the Word of God is saying. I'm not just saying it. So put to death or deprive of power the evil longings of your earthly body. Now, you notice he didn't say of the mind. He didn't say of your spirit. He said of your body. We talk about flesh and being able to get that flesh, those senses, under control. With its sensual, self-centered instincts, morality, impurity, sinful passions, evil desires, and greed, which is a kind of idolatry. So this allowing our bodies to do things we shouldn't do is a form of idolatry because it, it places your devotion to God. You're doing what I want to do instead of what God tells us to do. Does that make sense? So here's the same scripture from the King James. And then I went to the Strong's Concordance and got our, um, what does it mean? So to mortify, it says to mortify, therefore your members, it says to put to death. Now that doesn't mean to kill yourself. But what that means is there's, there's things that your body is wanting to do that we need to take control over and go, no body, you're not doing that. We're not doing that today. Um, and then Strong's, the Greek, 3196, uh, your members, that's pieces of your body. So when your eyes want to look at pornography, you have to take control and go, eyes, no, we're not doing that today. Or if your hand wanted to steal, then you would need to say, mm -mm, hand, we're not doing that today. Um, if your tongue wants to, you know, give somebody a whiplash and, then we say, no, we're not doing that. And so the things that are listed here, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So Matthew in 6.33 says, no, let's stop. Let's don't go there just yet. The thing that I admire in another person, is it love or is it lust? They, um, it's kind of like when we talk about faith and fear, how they're similar. Like faith has the power to bring things positive in my life and fear has the power to bring negative things in my life. Um, this love and lust is kind of the same thing, but lust takes, but it only, it only gives to receive, okay? Envy and jealousy and covetousness reinforce that bitterness. And bitterness, we already learned, comes from unforgiveness, from being hurt. The root of covetousness leads to envy and jealousy. So that root of I want, I want to have, or I don't have enough, God's not good enough to me, leads to envy and jealousy, which is not trusting God to take care of you. So this is a form of doubt and unbelief. So we need to be content with whatever we have. I want to give you an axiom to deal with envy and jealousy and covetousness. And that is, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you, Matthew 6, 33. So, James 3, 16. Let's see where we're at. Hold on, just a second. Okay, 
I know we talked about where envy and strife on there's every evil work. So that's about envy and, and how it's affecting your life. Envy is trying to steal from you. If envy can get you feeling envy, then you will be in strife with people around you. Your life will be miserable. But guess what? Envy's not miserable because you're feeling his yuck. Strife isn't miserable because you feel his yuck. So Hebrews um, 13.5, let your conversation, we've done this one several times, right? Let your conversation be without that covetousness. Let that be just a simple conversation and let it be. Not, I'm, I'm talking to you because I know you're going to say positive things to me. Or I'm talking to you because you're not doing what I want you to and I want to make you do something. For he has said, God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You're not looking to someone else. We're looking to God for our answers. Luke 12, 15. Speaking to the people, Jesus continued, said, be alert for your heart from greedy from greed and always wishing for what you don't have for your life can never be measured by the amount of things you possess. Idolatry puts our eyes on things, um, things we want to have things. We, you know, you see someone else has and he goes, wow, I wish I had that. Uh, greed is really, really good about getting us to do that. And so we want to be sure that we're being very conscientious about what we're thinking. Galatians, okay, and we, we already talked about this one too. We did. We must forsake all jealousy because it diminishes the value of others. You see? So may we never be arrogant or look down on another for each of us is an original. You see, each of us is original. God doesn't make cookie cutter people, so we can't all be the same. So Hebrews 13, 6, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man can do to me. You see, that brings envy and jealousy, brings fear, fear of death, fear of man. Uh, it makes you um, be afraid of people and what they can do to you. It happened to Saul. You see, Saul had a fear of man um, instead of trusting God. So it says um, the fear of man um, will, it drives you to envy and jealousy, to bitterness and resentment. It says if you could be perfect, you would be accepted. So it looks, it's always looking for the acceptance of man. And this leads you directly into idolatry because I'm not going to let people hurt me. And there we go. Envy and jealousy is rooted in idolatry. And the keys for understanding envy and jealousy are in Hebrews 13. We're not going there tonight. But Hebrews 13 um, gives us an understanding of, of envy and jealousy. Number one, it is not trusting God. Number two, is not believing that he will take care of you. And number three, not accepting yourself as he has accepted you. You see, fear of man is tied in with that envy and jealousy and covetousness. You may think, I've just looked and acted like those people, then I would be accepted by them. Because you don't feel you're accepted by them because you don't have all that they have at the level you think you should have it then envy and jealousy produces bitterness and resentment. You see, in Colossians 3, 5, tells us covetousness is idolatry. It's the same sin as idol worship. And we don't want to be there. We want to serve Jesus. And you can't serve Jesus and serve idols at the same time. Um, it does not come... Envy and jealousy... It, is rooted in this idolatry and it doesn't come out of a pure flow of admiration and relationship because this this yucky thing is behind it these yucky thoughts and feelings there's nothing wrong with admiring a, you know good things in other people but 
the thing you admire in the other person, when you look at them, it's the very thing you want. Um, and that's covetousness. Covetousness will leave you into envy and jealousy. Anything you could esteem more than God is idolatry. So husbands, and maybe, you know, your, her husband, this other lady's husband does things you see him do for her that your husband doesn't do. You go, well, I really want that. Okay, or your friend. Maybe she's more of an extrovert and you're an introvert and you really wish you could just say those things and have those conversations, but they don't happen for you. We already mentioned children. Um, pastors, you know, people, people envy other people's pastors. More so in the past than now because, I mean, there's so much internet preaching and teaching that goes on. You don't have that as much. But um, rock stars. Uh, athletic people, you know, the football players and the basketball players and the hockey players, all those folks. The only person who is eternal is God. And you are eternal only by the grace of God. Because when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you became a new creature in Christ because of what Christ and what God had done for you. God has done everything he's ever going to do to make all the provision for you. And it kind of works. I'm going to turn the screen off just for a second so you can see me. It kind of works like an umbrella. You see, when we choose to be under God's authority and we choose to do the things that God tells us we need to do in order so that we can access the promises of God and the provision of God, and see, some people go, well, you know, it's okay if I don't do this, or it's okay if I don't do that. What we have to do is what the Word of God says. See, if we're not doing what the Word of God says, then we're not under that umbrella of protection. We choose to move out to one side, and then we go, oh, God's not taking care of me. You know, God let bad things happen to me. No, it wasn't God. You move. You stop doing the things that God has called us to do and tells us to do. Now, I have some young friends out there that, you know what, they haven't been taught. They, they've accepted Jesus as their Savior, and it's a guy and a girl, and they're living outside of marriage. They don't know. Nobody ever taught them that they were supposed to get married and live under a covenant with God. They don't realize they're living in adultery. God doesn't have, there's not as much openness to consequence then as there is if you are a christian man or a christian woman choosing to live an adulterous life god set the rules for a reason and if you choose not to follow his rules you choose not to do the things that god tells you to do then you choose to move that umbrella of protection off of you and your family especially if you're ahead of a household. Now, saying this isn't easy, and, and I take seriously what God has asked me to do, and that's teach his word. So if I'm stepping on toes and I'm making you uncomfortable, I can't apologize, but I'm sorry you're having a hard time hearing the truth. This is what the word of God says. The truth will set you free, and that's the deal. You've got to know the truth will set you free. And so if you're not living the way God tells you to live, you need to get in to a Bible teaching church and you need to start living by what the word of God says, because then you will be set free and then you will have the blessings of Abraham on you. Okay. So, um, here we go. Let's go back to this. Oops, share my screen. I want to share that one with you. Okay. Yeah, God has done everything he's going to do to make provision for you. He has done it all. Um, all you have to do is accept it. You have to accept it by faith, and you have to believe it by faith. Don't let anyone, visible or invisible, steal that from you. God's done everything. So we just have to line up under what God says we need to do. And it's already paid for. It's already done. Envy and jealousy 
was found as far back in the Bible as the fall of man coming up with Cain and Abel. Uh, sometimes idolatry of others um, stems from self-rejection. Um, a jealousy over a relationship with God, um, jealousy over some gifts that people have and others don't, or the relationship with a parent. Well, you know in the story in um, Genesis with Cain and Abel, Cain was jealous over God accepting Abel's sacrifice. Abel brought a good sacrifice, and Cain brought a eh, sacrifice. Well, then Cain got jealous. Well, God came and talked to Cain. It's like, look, evil is, sin is lurking at your door. If you don't stop what you're doing right now, then it's going to come and have you do things you shouldn't do. And instead of being grateful to God for warning him, Cain got more mad. So, um... Sometimes you see it like this, like a body. And so each one of us has a body, but the foot can't tell the hand that it's not useful. Or vice versa, the hand wouldn't tell the foot you're not useful. But sometimes in the Christian body of Christ, it, it's not often said, but sometimes it's implied that you're not as important as I am. And that's hard to hear. But that is not what God says. God said every member of the body is important. And we each have something to do that's important. And some people would say, hey, the little toe is not very important. But it is. Have you ever tried walking without one? Or have you ever kicked it, made it hurt really bad, and then tried to walk? Yeah, the little toe is really important. Um... As we're going through this, I know we've talked about unforgiveness and how if you have unforgiveness, you, you get that high octane ping when you're talking about uh, people or situations. And when, when we're talking about envy and jealousy, if you're getting that high octane ping, it probably means that you've got some envy and jealousy going on and your, your spirit man's trying to let you know, hey, that this is a problem. We really need to wake up and pay attention here. The Spirit of God makes it possible for us to have a pure relationship with people, whether or not they're goofy and regardless of whether they have it together or not. It isn't what they're doing. It's what you're doing. It, ha it doesn't have to do with them. Your choice of having a relationship with them, it's okay, as long as your heart is healed. Now, if you've got a broken heart, you need to be aware of who you're in relationship with because those, those yucky things will reach out and try to hook up with you to trigger you. And when I say trigger you, several of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. So somebody in that group of people has to get spiritual. Somebody's got to get whole, well, and free. Now, if it's a man and a woman and they're married and in a relationship, either the husband or the wife's got to get whole, well, and free to make this thing move forward. As long as you're both broken, it's very, very difficult to move things forward. I mean, sometimes by the grace of God, a husband and a wife will start moving forward together. And that is an awesome thing. But more often than not, it is the husband or the wife that says, wait, I'm going to get healed. I'm going to get delivered. I'm going to get set free and then be able to come back and help the mate. And then the children get whole, well, and free. So... Okay, I didn't do the right button, here we go. No, it's stuck for some reason. There we go, Matthew 7, 12. It says, it tells us to do to others what we would have them do to us. So we call it, it's, this isn't the golden rule one, but yeah, it's, you know, often uh, people who have envy and jealousy, it would be, um, well, they didn't say hi to me, or they didn't call me. Well, hello, you have a phone, you have a hand, and you have a mouth. You could say hi to someone else. You know, you're, you're judging other people for not doing what you wanted done to you, but in all essence, you should be doing it too. 
See, that, that spirit always points out what other people are doing wrong. Um, like, well, they wouldn't smile at me. See there? I knew I was just a, you know, a worm. I knew it. These are the dynamics of torment that some of us have to put up with. These one-liners the enemy throws at us. This is the stuff that's separating us from God and us from other people and us from ourselves. It, it puts you in judgment and criticism of yourself. Um, we have to fellowship with God so we can have the fellowship with ourselves, and we can love ourselves the way God told us to. And then and only then can we have fellowship with others at a proper level. Um, remember, envy and jealousy in action destroys you. To get free, we have to get right with God. And uh, chastening or correction of the Lord is unpleasant sometimes. It's hard. Um, but it always brings forth peace in a person's life. Envy and jealousy um, reinforces bitterness and is rooted in covetousness and represents the major stronghold that bitterness and unforgiveness has in your life. Covetousness, envy, and jealousy are equal to idolatry and self-idolatry. Idolatry is you looking at anything other than God to fulfill your identity and needs. And envy and jealousy is rooted in not trusting God, but in trusting in yourself and others. That's idolatry. So in 1 John um, 3.20, for our hearts... For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. These entities, these yuckies, these thoughts and emotions can dominate a person's life so that they think that it's your own thought. You think you're thinking this way. We see when, when I was going through um, depression and I had a lot of anxiety, and I would have these yucky thoughts, and I thought they were my thoughts. But the more I studied and the more I learned about this, the more I found out that, you know what, I don't say things like that about myself. And God doesn't say things about that, like that, about me. So it must be the enemy. And there was no one else in my life speaking evil over me at the time either. Well, envy and jealousy, we talked a little bit ago, I mentioned it, how it could affect a marriage. And so Numbers 5.14 talks about jealousy in a marriage. And I, I went and did a little research and I put it in here about um, envy and jealousy from the Strong's Concordance. And it says the spirit of jealousy, um, and I put the number in there, is quina. And quina, well, that's not funny. Is, is a spirit that comes on someone, is actually the, the Hebrew name of jealousy that comes on a person. And it would make him jealous of other things. But th in this instance, it's his wife. And um, kana is to make jealous in a bad way, to provoke someone. So he's provoking his wife or he's, he's irritated or jealous with her. And it, it can make her defiled, but it doesn't have to. It depends on what's going on in the wife's heart. Okay? That's a little tricky here. Yeah, that yucky thing makes, makes the person jealous. That yucky, those yucky thoughts make you feel jealous. Okay. And so the man and woman get jealous of their spouses and the woman is attacked because of her making, well, like eye contact at the store. I can tell you that when I was younger, I lived with my grandma for a season and grandma and grandpa definitely had issues, but grandpa was very jealous of her grandma. And I mean, if she had worked with a guy at work and he happened to come by at the store and say hi, when she got home, oh my goodness, did she get, you know, a tongue lashing for talking to that man in the store? Well, come to find out years and years later, Grandpa was having an affair, had had affairs on Grandma over and over and over again. 
But you see, what we see is the, the partner who's having a fear, that's the accuser. That's the one who spends his time or her time accusing. So that would defile the wife. If the husband is having an affair, that would defile the wife. Um, and so it creates arguments because the wife is attacked and then, or vice versa, the husband is attacked and they haven't done anything wrong. So they go to defend themselves and then we have the argument start. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay. Whoops. What do we got? And he goes up to the mountain and calleth unto him who, whom he would, and they came out unto him. And he ordained the twelve that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach and to have the power to heal the sick and to cast out devils. Um, for There it is. I've already read that one. I did. Okay. So Jesus sent them out and he gave them power. He has given us authority to heal the sick and to cast out devils. To have that authority, we have the same authority in the name of Jesus that Jesus did in his own authority. So we will have to use that. Okay, so every night we meet, the Lord has asked me to make an opportunity for anyone who does not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior to be able to accept Jesus and become a new creature in Christ. Now, it doesn't matter where you are, what you've done, what you've been a part of, how bad it is. There is absolutely nothing you can do as an unsaved person that God can't save you from. It is so easy to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You're going to speak a prayer with faith, believing, and God will be yours. So you're just agreeing with God. That's it. So repeat after me. I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that you will not cast me out. I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I believe that Jesus died for me according to the scriptures. And I believe that he was raised from the dead for my justification, according to the scriptures, so that I might be set right with God. I believe that because of his death, burial, and resurrection, I am set right with God. So I receive Jesus as my Savior, and I accept Jesus as my Lord. And your word says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm calling on the name of the Lord, so I know that I am saved. You say, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, that I would be saved. And with my heart, I believe I am made righteous with God. And with my mouth, I confess I am saved. In the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach Jesus, amen. And amen. I'll see you next week. We're going to look at that spirit of rejection next week. Have a great week. Bye.